A very good afternoon. I'm Aisha and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our monthly actuary cell therapy lecture series. Today's lecture focuses on developing fetal MSC for therapies. Let's welcome Prof. Cherry <coughs> Chan, our distinguished speaker for today's webinar. Prof. Chan is a senior clinician scientist and is a practicing accredited specialist in assisted reproductive technique in KKH Singapore. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist in London. Prof Chan completed his PhD in intrauterine stem cell therapies at Imperial College London. Thereafter, he returned to Singapore and started the Experimental Fetal Therapy Laboratory with a primary focus in developing novel fetal molecular therapies in the form of gene transfer and stem cell transplantation. Since then, he has been continuously funded by major grant funding bodies for his research and published over 250 papers. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type the question into the Q&A window. Um, Prof Chan will address these questions after the presentation. And now, without further ado, I will hand the time over to Prof Chan. Prof Chan, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone here. Um, it's a pleasure to be giving this talk. Um, basically, I'll be sharing what we have been do uh, doing for um, the development of fetal mesenchymal stem cells for clinical therapy itself. So I would like to talk about, you know, the relationship of the use of MSCs uh, to address two problems, one prenatal and one postnatal. All right. If you look at um, the perspective of uh, obstetrician, um, we look at monogenic diseases. Is uh, usually most of them are single gene mutations. Happens in up to one percent of births. This accounts for ten thousand different human diseases. Nobody is immune. Forty percent of all hospital admissions in childhood are uh, caused by single gene mutations. This causes significant morbidity and mortality, and damage can sometimes occur prenatally. So some of these uh, conditions, such as alpha thalassemia, you uh, you know you uh, can result in fetal demise um, or perinatal damage or demise, such as the enzyme deficiency disorders. This can lead to developmental obstacles in childhood and adulthood, uh, like you know resulting in a neurological handicap or failure or even shortened lifespan in many uh, cases. So the option for treatment could be open fetal surgery, uh, you know, uh, you could have cellular therapy or gene therapy, and this has developed uh, quite aggressively over the last 50 years, started in, starting in 1980. So the rationale for fetal therapy, um, one of the most important uh, concepts here is the issue about immunogenic um, naivety. So th this is a slide uh, published by Ray Owen in Science, 1945, that shows when you breed a uh, Guernsey cow with sperm from both Guernsey and Hereford bull, occasionally you will get twins that have both parental uh, uh, paternal types, leading to two different kind of uh, blood types. So in this case, they also share a large anatomical anastomosis in utero. And when they're born, you could find that the offspring have Two different blood types mm -hmm. and this is shows the uh, possibility of tolerance induction uh, in the fetal life and later on billingham and madawa uh, showed in their famous um, paper in 1953 experimental tolerance being induced by injecting in this case b strain mouse cells into an a strain mouse embryo and this lead to a complete ability to tolerate allergenic skin grafts leading to a nobel prize and the birth of solid organ transplants so the other uh, rationale for fetal therapy, you could avoid end organ damage in utero. Um, you know, there's a small fetus at the moment, so, so there's cost efficiency in terms of del uh, delivering any stem cells or gene vectors. And also, um, it's, you know, in the fetal life, particularly different types of stem cell niche are available for uh, transduction or engraftment itself. So in our world, um, you know, every pregnancies are screened. We can offer prenatal diagnosis, be it by fetal sampling or even maternal blood DNA, and leading to a diagnosis. And then comes decision time, and the, the options are stuck. You either continue with affected pregnancy, 
or you terminate a pregnancy, which happens in the majority of cases in Singapore and most part of the world. Or at that point in time, I was thinking maybe we could offer them intrauterine molecular or cellular therapy. So uh, in this first part, I'm just going to describe our journey from an idea all the way to clinical translation for the use of fetal MSCs for osteogenesis imperfecta. So OI, um, you know, the many subtypes, here's the David Cillian's classifications from the very mild type 1 to the severe type 3 you see in life, uh, perinatally, uh, basically, you don't see type 2 here because they are uh, perinatally lethal. This is a, usually an autosomal dominant defect affecting collagen 1A or 1A2 defects are disrupting triple collagen. So your bones are fragile, uh, skin and teeth, all these have uh, various kinds of outcomes. There are also uh, you know, emerging autosomal recessive ones that affects different parts of the collagen chain, um, uh, uh, basically translation. So the second thing is, um, is uh, fetal MSCs. Fetal MSCs were first discovered in the Nick Fist lab in Imperial College in year 2000. And we find that they stick on plastic, grow like spindle-shaped cells. Their immune phenotype is really MSCs like the adult phenotype. They self-renew uh, quite a bit. Here we show over 100 population uh, doublings without slowing down. They differentiate into a fat bone cartilage and also muscle and neuro in a limited way, which we show in a couple of PhDs. Um, the one thing about MSC is that they do migrate to areas of inflammation. Here we see on the left side here, we have a phototrombotic stroke on this side of the brain, and we uh, transplant fetal MSCs, and you can see them tracking over by day 5 and day 12, and you can find them histologically as well. We also show that uh, you can actually try, um, inject them into the liver, and they will migrate to areas of cancer. So the one thing we also realized is that the fetal MSCs are highly osteogenic. So we did a comparative study uh, comparing fetal bone marrow MSCs with fetal umbilical cord derived ones and adult sources from bone marrow and adipose tissue. Here you can see they're highly proliferative, from small, um, um, basically CFUF assays, higher calcium deposition, ARP induction. Um, they don't slow down, characteristically they're stable, uh, non-tumorogenic, we've transplanted them in over 1,600 mice, some rats, and some pigs as well. So the disease that we were in, um, very interested in was OI type 3. Um, earlier in the millennium, at all, always actually showed that in OI type 3 babies, if you give them a, a MS infusion, that this will increase mineralization and also uh, increase their growth velocity. And there was OI and mouse model. So the problem with OI, the drug, in this case, being fetal MSCs. So the question was really, can fetal transplantation strengthen the bone itself and reduce fractures, even in utero? So first, we developed a way to um, inject stem cells into a mouse embryo. This is an E14 mice, about one gram in, uh, in size uh, and weight. Uh, we injected, uh, in this case, either IV or IP. Um, these are labeled for GFP. And then we replicated this into OI mice, and this is transduced with elucifrase and GFP by reporter and antivirus. And we can find and identify human uh, cells by either fish techniques on the human's pancentromeric uh, chromosome marker or by qPCR itself. Here we show 5% of the cells in the bone actually is uh, human in origin, uh, whereas the non-bone um, uh, non tissues uh, have a lower level of chimerism. So we also show that over 12 weeks, there's the presence of xenogenic tolerance. These are not immunocompromised mice. And uh, this is histological analysis. You see presence of human protein and osteopontin, especially in the calyces, human ventin, and uh, basically all over the bone, especially where the fractures has occurred and healed. In terms of um, bone, uh, you, you know, bone uh, regeneration, here we show the reduction in height Growth plate height, there's increased in bony speculation and also increase in cortical bone thickness. And more importantly, we find a two-third reduction in fracture frequency, which forms the basis of why this can be done clinically. So uh, right about that time, in a year after we published and a few years later, we should also show um, clinical benefit, at least in a mouse model for fetal transplantation. So clinical cases, uh, Thus far to date includes uh, this graph. I, I think I left, uh, there's a number of cases that are not here because they're not completely OI cases, 
in Karolinska, which is the first case, the, the child is now 18 years of age. In Singapore, we've done two cases and they're now 13 and seven years of age in Taiwan as well. So just to share with a slide of how this progressed in a time where stem cells were still sexy and MRC was willing to fund the work. This took eight years from idea to bench and bedside, from characterization, the mouse model, disease mouse model, looking at genomic stability, the protocol for CGMP, IRV and approvals and oxygenic studies, leading to our first patient in Singapore in 2009 in collaboration with uh, NUH OBGYN, pediatrics and the tech lab, at that time headed by James Tweed. So the first case, referral from Taiwan, uh, this child has uh, basically a, a, a fractures in neutral. This is a tire bone. It looks more like a boomerang here. Uh, it shouldn't look like that. And uh, we find multiple fractures and short long bones. And uh, MUCNTC showed the genotype mutation and collagen 1A2 gene. Uh, so we did a fetal MSC transportation at 32 weeks gestation. This is the old tech lab. That's a very much younger version of myself, uh, still knowing how to use a syringe at that point in time. So we transplanted um, XY or male cells uh, into a female fetus in the hope of tracing uh, later on. So 40 million cells went into the intrahepatic vein, which is where the umbilical vein comes in and back to the heart. Uh, we gave a dose of almost 30 million per kilogram. And essentially, this tolerated infusion very well, probably because the MSCs bypassed the lung and you know, fetal circulation, and everything was fine and dandy. And baby was delivered by cesarean delivery six weeks later, uh, looking uh, pretty okay. Uh, whole plain x ray of the entire body shows evidence of huge fractures and healing fractures, uh, such as this right sided femur. Um, the DEXA scan shows bone mineralization, and you can see the increase improvement in bone mineralization up to here uh, that we measured. This was a one year of age. And this phosphonate therapy was only started from one year. So this is a length chart and you can see uh, growth within the third centile all the way to 12 months of age. And suddenly we found, uh, you, know, so, uh, you know, flattening, plateauing of the growth curve. At a point in time, there was a lot of studies showing that the effects of MSE Transplantation is transient, and that's what we thought was happening. So we brought her back again and gave her a second transfusion. This, in this case, goes natally. And after that, you see the growth going on well. And the child was uh, remarkably full of, uh, free of pain with one hip fracture, a uh, treatment splinting thus far. Uh, so we have our five minutes of fame um, on news channels here in Taiwan and publish that. So in summary here, the pre- and postnatal MSC for OI is probably safe and efficacious with an increase in growth and reduction in fractures. Mid-gestational allogeneic MSC infusion is not rejected, uh, at least not acutely. And there's now an open-label trial in Stockholm especially. And uh, well, we're trying to do the same thing before, but getting a lot of hurdles. Uh, this is what we think MSC is going to be like with the diagnosis and genotypic diagnosis. Uh, we go in for MS infusion to reduce the chance of fetal um, fractures from occurring or worsening and monitoring growth and mineralization postnatally with MS infusion to optimize skeletal growth all the way up to maybe final height. Okay, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk a bit about postnatal applications, uh, about large bone defects, as you can see here. Once you get to a certain uh, gap that, um, you know, basically there's a lot of problems trying to heal that. You could use bone grafting, which is the current golden standard, but about five to 10% end up in non-union, malunion, especially in older um, patients because of the lack of uh, stem cell compartments that declines with age. You could use a tissue engineered bone graft, a potential market that's uh, growing, or our goal in our lab was to develop a cell-based tissue engineered bone graft that's off the shelf, allogenic, that can also induce vasculogenic and osteogenic induction. So this MSC is grown in 3D PCR scaffolds from osteopore. Uh, we collaborate extensively with Joe Sweegan at that time in NUS and then NTU and then back to and so on and so forth. Here we show that when you load uh, this macroporous uh, PCR scaffolds, um, the MSCs from the fetal ones actually are more cellular uh, with higher mineralization. Uh, you put in an in vivo samples, you find basically high levels of survival, but then again, these are not skin mice. There's a lot of tissue integration. 
Um, we also worked with the idea of bioreactor cultures. We tested a whole range of uh, bioreactors to find the best ones. And this is to really simulate the physiological environment, enhance mass transfer. There's also elements of mechanical uh, transduction for bone differentiation. All right. So um, of all the things we tried out here, we show that uh, the bioaxial rotating uh, bioreactor that was developed in conjunction with uh, single polytechnic uh, enhance the best cellularity and final cell density. Here you see in vitro, uh, the, the cells growing very well and final cellularity is much better. Um, in terms of mineralization, you, you they get a lot more ALP activity and calcium content. Even when you put it in vivo, there's a higher survival and also increase in ectopic bone uh, dense uh, bone formation. These are micro CT analysis. So then we put in on the critical salmon defect in the rat. And here you see the gap. And we put in the scaffold here after two weeks of culture and we analyze them. Here you could see uh, micro CT images with, uh, with angiography. And you can see when you put a cellular scaffold there, you have really enhanced kind of vas vascular invagination that is absent in a control acellular um, group. And this is probably to do with the fact that feeder MSTs do secrete a lot of vasoactive peptides. Uh, there's a fourfold increase in vessel density here. In terms of bone, you see the complete bridging of between um, the two ends here after about 12 weeks or two, three months in duration with a, you know, much more vascularization compared to the acellular um, graph, which is just the osteopore scaffold itself. Oh, then we went on the pig because we went to HSA and they were, they were trying to figure out how long should you do it for, how long should you leave it in. Um, we Nobody was very sure, so we put it in. Uh, created the model um, once again with NUH uh, orthopedics help and uh, developed ways to measure vascularity and mineralization. And here we we actually kept now in 26 months and um, there are no tumors, just to say we think we did about 24, 22 experimental groups, uh, animals, no tumors was found, no severe reaction, some complications when the kick, uh, when the pigs start kicking over the place and breaking their fractures, uh, they really broke their huge fractures. Basically, there was gross visual defects in all with enhanced uh, healing scene in the TEVG group. Uh, this micro CT showing complete. In fact, when we went in the harvest, we couldn't even tell that uh, it was a fractured leg. So once again, this is a timeline that we did for the critical size defect phase one trial. Uh, it was 10 years from idea of conception to bench and then to bedside. Over $2 million of funding for NMRC RIGs. Uh, to two grad students, one RF, collaborations with biomaterials, orthopedics. We got our IRB very early on, HSA by 2014. Uh, recruited our first patient um, with trauma services at NUHS. At that time was NUH. Uh, the first patient was recruited. So it was our RTA with a large gap here. And um, I could play the video, but okay. So this is a micro CT model, uh, which uh, shaped with uh, intramedullary uh, rim here um, in preparation. We seeded it, put it into bioreactor culture for priming. And then unfortunately, the day before we were supposed to transplant, there was a hard stop, which is heartbreaking in a way. So you could see the translation pathway here from cell culture, uh, scat apples, bioreactor, mouse, rat studies, mouse, rat, pig studies. And then when we went to clinical trials, it was a hard stop by the then HOD. So uh, just to summarize the challenges that we find in MSC-based therapies, at least in regenerative medicine, um, in, in terms of cellular expansion, you know, how we maintain a naive state is still not worked out. Uh, we think that hypoxic culture, low density culture is going to be, work better, maybe even with micro carriers. Numbers may not be a huge challenge but when you use feeder sources compared to adult sources. Um, you know, you have multiple rounds of trypsinization massaging. You could use microcarriers, and we have explored this extensively with uh, Stevo at uh, BTI. However, funding is a problem. There's a lack of farmer interest. It's very difficult to pattern. Uh, feeder sources are, are still contentious, even in Singapore. And since 2012, there's a lack of NMRC interest for regenerative medicine kind of IRGs. Uh, there's also HBI considerations now that feeder sources are uh, being procured. Um, of course, you must have aligned values between researchers, clinicians, and also administrators, uh, which may be able to circumvent the problems of you know, trials being stopped because egos, perhaps. Okay, this is the team that I worked with for the last 17 years. Uh, some old, some new, some have left on to um, 
new places. I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Yong, Yong Lulin itself, uh, Singapore, and immunology uh, works with Australia and also in Europe and the US and all the funding sources here. With that, thank you. And I would like to take any questions that um, here. Prof Chan, for the very detailed and elaborate presentation on your work, um, we'll now proceed with the Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type your question in the Q&A function below. All right, we have a question from Wikia. Where, how are fetal MSCs harvested? Yeah, so a uh, common question. <laughs> um, this is um, basically, um, you know, we, we actually approach women who go for clinically indicated termination of pregnancies in Singapore. We have IRB. Uh, we have uh, safeguards in place uh, that follows the poking horn guidelines for procurement and use of uh, fetal tissues for either research or treatment. So in this case, uh, women were approached as they come for clinically indicated uh, terminations, we ask for a donation. And then when uh, the termination happens, um, the tissue is brought into a tech lab for, um, you know, basically to derive the stem cells. Okay, thank you, Prof Chan. Um, if anyone else has, okay, we have more questions now. Uh, we have another question from Manfred. Hello, Prof Chan, very impressive work that you're doing and appreciate your knowledge sharing. May I seek your guidance on the difference between fetal stem cells and embryonic stem cell? Um, okay, you're talking about ESLs that's derived from human blastocysts. Um, human blast, you know, this is uh, something that is done in the 80s and 90s and Jimmy Thompson did. Um, the difference is that uh, embryonic stem cells are you know, literally pluripotent and uh, they can form all different germ layers. Uh, when you talk of uh, fetal MSCs or MSCs in general, we're talking about more tissue-restricted stem cell type. Um, stem being, you know, you can self-renew without senescence and uh, you can differentiate down different pathways. So you're talking about something that is really further down the developmental pathway. And they're very different. I mean, there are different contentions here. You know, one one could say that uh, the era of uh, ESL derived therapies is put on hold right now, large, largely because of the advent of iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells. All right. Next question from Jeremy. Several cord blood banks offer banking services of HFMC. How relevant mm -hmm. are they for clinical uses? Could you briefly elaborate on how you expand and characterize them for transplant uses? So the core blood banks, especially the private ones, have uh, given a lot of promotional materials um, suggesting that you could get stem cell-like things from the cord and you can differentiate them to every single tissue type, including cardiac, liver, blood, and all these things. And the reality is that um, data for that is not forthcoming. Um, we, you know, the use of cord blood, which contains like hemopoietic stem cells, is not debated because one percent of um, cord blood uh, mononuclear cells are actually CD34 positive and useful for, let's say, reconstitution of bone marrow. The other contentions part, I would say, is really the use of cord tissue. Right now, as I understand it, they snap freeze it. Um, or they freeze it in slow uh, in the tissue form. So the recovery rate for any cell type that you get that from is not going to be very high. Um, even if you have isolated cord derived MSCs and we've done different protocols, be it Watson's jelly or be it uh, vessel derived uh, methodologies, they look like MSCs. They are not probably as potent as fetal ones. Um, you can characterize them uh, like MSCs you do with self renewal. Uh, in vitro, in vivo methods, uh, the try differentiation at least, and all the different markers. Uh, right now, uh, if you look at the clinical utility, it is really uh, not recommended by almost every single professional, clinical professional group in the world, including the Royal College of St. Gaini, American uh, College of St. Gaini, and also the pediatric community. Um, how to get away with it with that promotional material is, uh, you know, is probably 
for another discussion. <laughs> so I'm uh, not too sure whether I answered your question as to how you, you characterize MSCs. I mean, Dominici uh, ISCT has already defined that uh, very, very long ago. Um, you know, but quality is, and uh, how you handle them is going to be very different in different labs. So court derived, um, once again, uh, court derived MSCs, um, there are many groups that are in a research phase. For example, uh, NUHS's group is looking at its use for wound healing and uh, other applications. Um, that's completely different. You know, we're not talking about banking. When you bank something, um, the way they are doing it right now, they have not shown any uh, data to suggest that you can recover any meaningful stem cells or even show any differentiation that they have claimed to do so. Yeah. Hey, Prof Chan, um, we have another question from Satyan Regrow Biosciences. Any MSc profiling done in terms of characterization identity for the clinical cases? Uh, we, we just did the, the usual, we, we harvested everything under the CGMP uh, condition, conditions and they were, they were ex culture expanded and then they were characterized at uh, the first passage. So we basically showed you the same immunophenotype that I showed you on one, one of the slides. We showed uh, CFUF ability uh, on edit. Um, some of them was done in a single cell, but not in these batches. Um, they are pure, so, and as pure as they can be. By the time we expand them for culture, they are already at P4, or P5. Um, and you don't see any hemopoietic contamination anymore at that point in time. Okay. So next question from Tianming Huang. What is the generation of MSC for treatment? Is it PS3 or more? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get that question. What is the generation of MSC for treatment? P3 or more? Oh, 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 oh. Um, it depends. So for the fetal MSCs, we usually go in by, we, we store them at P1 and P2. So you expand them um, to meaningful levels like the 40 million that we used. We're talking about starting with uh, three or four vowels, so three or four million, and uh, really low density uh, state, um, uh, seeding. And it's just two passages after that. So by P3 or P4, they're harvested for use. Um, we can't say thank you. Are there any specific tissue sources of the fetal MSC? Example, MSCs are from the fetal bone marrow, question mark, or are the MSCs just sorted from the fetus? Um, so in, in, in my lab, we have focused on bone marrow MSCs um, largely because um, there's still some epigenetic memory. I mean, if you compare I mean, when uh, the, the Nick Fitz lab first isolated fetal MSCs, they looked at fetal liver, fetal bone marrow, and fetal blood. So you, you can isolate MSCs from them. The fetal liver ones are predominantly being investigated by the Karolinska group in Sweden, Stockholm. And uh, whereas we, um, in our own hands, we found that bone marrow has um, far easier retrieval and they don't, they, they, are, they are basically more like the bone marrow derived MSCs from adults and they are far more osteogenic than let's say the fetal liver ones. Uh, so the two applications which you talk about here are bone related and uh, that led us to think about doing it that way. And in any case, um, there are ontological differences of the blood and liver. So when we did the studies, this is not published actually, we show that the uh, integrin expression patterns of MSCs um, changes, you know, the first wave uh, comes on the liver there's a area of hemopoiesis, mm -hmm. and then it migrates through the blood, and then you can find it in the blood uh, at high enough numbers to the bone marrow just before the hemopoietic cells move with it. So it's, you know, uh, in, in a way, nature is trying to prepare different niches for hemopoiesis uh, by sending MSCs to different areas. And um, therefore, if you look at the integrin expression uh, mm -hmm. studies on fetal liver versus bone marrow, they're quite different. Uh, we, yeah, you can, prob you know, we've done experiments like showing that you can get MSCs from everywhere, but this could be missed. You know, the, the idea that stroma cells can be grown for anywhere. Um, so we are quite particular about using bone marrow in this case. Next question from Elise Chen. Will the patient need re-injection later in her life? If so, what would be the source of MSC? So um, the, the, the patients that you've seen and also the, the cases done in Stockholm, we try to stick to the same uh, batch. Uh, it's not that we are, we are worried about immune rejection or recognition uh, because MSC just generally do not stimulate the kind of acute rejection. Yeah, HLA-2 
two negative and HIA one uh, very faint. Um, in fact, they're Im immunomodulate. But um, in terms of um, what we've done so far, the consensus was to stick with the same dose. And with the fetal ones, it is not a problem. I mean, if you had used adult sources, you would have run out, you know, 40 million, you might have, have to take another sample. For fetal ones, they just go on. So Jeremy Ng says, thank you. That was very informative and helpful. So um, it looks like we do not have any further questions. Um, so with that, um, we will wrap up our session. <clears throat> yeah, Ellie says, thank you. So since okay. we don't have any further um, questions, we will wrap up our, our session. On behalf of Actress, um, thank you very much, Prof Chan, for the enlightening presentation. And to all our audience, thank you for attending today's lecture. We hope to see you again in our next lecture on the 28th of September. So have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Prof. Cherry Chan. Okay, thank you. <laughs>